John, if you'll come on up, let's welcome John Barnes. Say here in case I go too long. Wait, said I act at two thirty. Yeah, no, no, I'm a preacher. Yeah, I'm not a preacher, my like boy. Well, it's uh, an honor to be here. Uh, I actually had the privilege of joining y'all uh, last year when Governor Stick uh, came over to the other place. But uh, we love it up here, growing up in Duncan. Uh, you know, I grew up on about fifty feet on the east side of Highway One. Uh, Looking up the hill at night, uh, you can see the neon uh, longhorn with the steers, the, the steer with the longhorns, Chisholm Trail Motel. Now, about 100 feet out my back door on the west side is Highway 81, the Chisholm Trail. So uh, I feel like there is uh, there is some uh, something more than, than randomness about how uh, my life has, has worked. And uh, I intend to live out my days. I hope there will be a lot more of them. Not tend to move on too quickly, but I hope whatever there are, that we're right here in Garfield County. I can't think of a place I'd rather be. And I certainly can't think of a place I'd rather be during what all's happened in 2020. So let me do this for you, John. Let me hold the mic. Yeah, sure. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll see uh, if I can chew bubble gum and uh, advance the PowerPoint at the same time. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is, in the few minutes that we have, is I'm going to share some Oklahoma history, but I'm also going to uh, share some resources with you all. Uh, if, if we needed any uh, encouragement, uh, I think we've gotten in the last few months that history and heritage, constitutional and republic government, is not something uh, that is just passed on by osmosis. There are people, as we've all seen in our TVs, that are actively out of the streets, not just demonstrating, not just protesting. Many of them, the majority, no doubt, are doing that. But there are also many that are attacking uh, not just the history of this country, the heroes, and the country itself. And I think it's become clear, as we've seen in the overthrow of governments in other countries in past generations, that it's very, very important to do that is you've got to detach the public, uh, in particular the young, from any sense of, of connection to and inspiration from those who have gone before them. So that involves uh, that, that involves indicting the past, the people that made the past, uh, holding them up, making them a source of ridicule so that no young person will want to be connected, much less attached to them. And then ultimately just erasing the past, where there's a national amnesia, a loss of memory on that there was ever anything special that came before. So monuments are not just acts of vandalism. Spray painting 1619 project on a monument has a very specific goal. It says that we support this turbocharged effort, again, to not just rewrite the history of America, but to rewrite America itself into something far different from what it is today. So at this point in time, I'm not saying that I'm enjoying 2020. Uh, there are times I find myself nostalgic for 2019 <laughs> and a lot of other times, right? But as a Christian, I also believe that it's by no accident that any of us have put where we are when we are. Uh, I've been convicted by Mordecai's old words. You remember Queen Esther, we forget this, she's about to crawfish and leave the stage and, and kind of chicken out. Uh, when she was queen of Persia and she found out that her people, the Jews, were getting ready to be put to the sword in mass. And oh, Mordecai, God bless him, in love, speaking the truth, in love, confronted her and said, you know, you have been called here for just such a time as this. And I think that's what we need to be engendering in our young people. We need to be building into them so if they're not swept away in the tide of social media peer pressure in the wrong direction, which is the direction they'll be carried if that's their main source of information. Well, what do we even have to tell the young people? We haven't studied and shown ourselves approved workmen of God ourselves. 
And I think for all of us in 2020, no matter how learned we are, uh, there's got to be at least some sense of I'm ill-equipped. I am ill-equipped for what all is coming down. We, I can't even keep up. I, I, I don't even know what all the headlines are, much less all the stories. It's happening so fast. The clock speaks 100 times what it normally is. Let me share a couple of resources. Uh, they help me. Okay, they help me and maybe they'll help you. This uh, uh, sheet that's going around, if, if you put your name and email on it, you'll, you'll get our blog each month. And some months, those are original Oklahoma history articles, all right? Some months, they're uh, podcasts and interviews. That's just a smattering of, uh, of cards of, that, that can show you some of the, the people and the themes. Oklahoma Gold is what uh, Wade referred to a moment ago. We have the wonderful privilege that, I don't know if any of y'all have heard it yet, but every Sunday night at 7.05 p.m., uh, Gwen Faulkner Lippert, who is one of the, who, no doubt in all the Hall of Fames for Oklahoma Broadcasting, she has this program on KTOK and iHeartRadio uh, every Sunday night from 7 to 9. It's been on 25, 30 years. And she went to them, and before I even knew about this, and proposed a weekly Oklahoma history program uh, with herself and me on there, which is come to be known as Oklahoma Go. And that's on every Sunday night on KTOK. I don't know if anybody knows, uh, anybody here in the house knows the fellow that owns the stations around here, but they're actually producing that to where it can be taken and uh, picked up and syndicated by other Oklahoma stations. Uh, they have removed KTOK, any reference to KTOK, iHeartRadio, from the podcast, so that if the station in Enid wanted to put that on at any time they wanted, they, they could take it and duplicate it. Basically, what we're talking about on there uh, is the good, the bad, the outrageous, and the inspirational of Oklahoma history. And Wade mentioned that Prentice Scott was a program last night. Uh, J.P. Sandifer, actually, I mentioned him in the program. Uh, last week, it was the Cherokee Outlaw of 1893, which we're right in the middle of right now. Uh, you know, I found that most folks, if you say the land run, they say, well, that was a great deal. And they're shocked when, when they find out there's actually multiple land runs. I think you guys up here know your history better than, than probably most do in Oklahoma. But that's Oklahoma Gold, so you can hear that on KTOK. And then uh, we have the podcast. Uh, we'll put you on our uh, uh, bill where you'll get alerted when those podcasts come up to our website. There's Prince Scott already talked. That's the Cherokee Strip Run. Uh, one, like one mention about another book. And by the way, usually my wife is here, Grace, in the past, uh, helping me run a book table afterwards with books. But as Wade mentioned, there are some big doings going on in Wacomus right now that she's right in the middle of. So back there, there's a table with a couple of copies of each of my books on them. If you see anything you're interested in, you can order those through our website. I got a bunch of cards back there. Uh, and if you do that, just tell me how you want them signed, if you want them signed. And we'll either deliver them to your house up here, or we'll get them to the Rotary Club, and we'll get them to you real quick. Uh, that book right there, uh, every time a monument, and it could be Robert E. Lee or Abraham Lincoln or Frederick Douglass or Ulysses S. Grant, all of whose monuments are being torn down and vandalized. Uh, every time one of those comes down, we sell more copies of this book. Uh, it's the one volume, if you want to know all the reasons for it, what happened and the major players, generals, soldiers, politicians, but also nurses, spies, uh, business people, uh, blockade runners, uh, and then the consequences afterwards, that's the book. It's been printing now uh, over the last 12 years, War Between the States, America's Uncivil War. So uh, that's why my wife's not here today. She's running the most place. Uh, this is in Wacomas. And a uh, bunch of our employees are Enid residents, okay? <laughs> and we're hiring more people. And of course, all of our employees come up here and, and buy from you guys. So there's lots of Enid sales tax there. So Marcy, we are your friend, okay? But uh, that, that's what she's doing, and there are great things going on in, in Wacomas. A, a year, maybe 18 months ago, that was a 100-year-old empty uh, block that's been rebuilt. There's actually a couple of stores to the left that aren't, aren't in that picture. And then next year, uh, volume two of the Oklahomans, uh, I don't know what was wrong with me thinking we about had it finished, and then the pandemic hit. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess we'll have to have a paragraph or two in the epilogue and 
kind of got a little bigger. Well, I guess we'll have to have a page or two. Well, doggone, we'll have to add a chapter just on 2020. And now people are saying, no, you need a whole book. You need a volume three on 2020. Uh, the book that wouldn't die, right? Well, you know, keep getting sick and trying to kill volume two of the Oklahomans and it won't die. But that's the cover picture when the book does come out. Taken by my dear friend Nick Pryor, uh, longtime OETA uh, news director and executive director, and, and now he's the manager of uh, KGOU Radio and OU. That, uh, that picture, I have it on here for a number of reasons. Uh, anybody recognize where that might be? More. More, that's correct. That's, Pl that's where Plaza Tower School was, okay? Now, by the grace of God, Plaza Tower School is rebuilt much more beautiful, magnificent, and structurally sound than it was before. But we were doing cleanup, as a lot of, a lot of us were all summer after that, and uh, Nick caught this unforgettable picture. It looked like Dresden or Nagasaki at the end of World War II. As far as the eye could see, that's what it looked like in every direction in the middle of war. And this one wind-blasted trunk still stood and somebody had strapped an Oklahoma flag up to it. And you may be able to see on the left there, it looks like a towel hanging. It's actually sheet metal that's been wrapped around that branch, uh, like a pretzel. And I don't know if you can tell very well on the screen here, but believe it or not, in the distance is the tornadic uh, line of storms that became what we now refer to as March 31st. That was 11 days after March 20th. And some of y'all may remember uh, the second most powerful tornado, tornado ever recorded behind May 3rd, 1999 or more, came that next day. And uh, they say that if that thing had not slowed down when it did, that half of Oklahoma City might have been destroyed. March 31st is the tornado all the meteorologists study now as the great exemplar of what all could happen if a perfect storm hits. But anyway, this reminds me that as we work on finishing Volume 2, have any of you all, raise your hand if you have seen Volume 1 of the Oklahomans. Okay, we haven't done a very good job marketing, have we? But, um, I'm going to say this, Volume 1 uh, has had a good response, it's exciting, there's oil booms, the trails of tears, the land runs, uh, the Civil War in Oklahoma, Indian Territory, I grew up here, never even knew it happened here. Volume 2, there's a couple of differences. One is, of course, it's, it's the modern history, it's the history we're part of. I promise you, every person in this room, you're going to know some of the people that are in Volume 2, okay? It runs from World War I, basically, up to the present, including 2020. But the other thing I've noticed, writing it, rewriting, editing, re-editing, working with my editors, all of whom are, are, are historians full-time, doctoral uh, uh, history, history professors, is that emotionally, it is just overwhelming compared to Volume 1. Volume 1 was kind of a remarkable adventure story. There were places like on the Trails of Tears and others that were, were, were heartrending. But this book, when you read, and we try to be very careful and not cross a line to being inappropriate, but when you read these stories that people you know were in, Plaza Towers Elementary School, or Briarwood, these schools that tornadoes blew through with children hovering under their desk singing Jesus loves me. That's what they requested at Plaza Towers, their teachers, that they could sing when they knew and heard and saw the tornado coming. That's what those children were singing at the moment it, it blasted into Plaza Towers. Or how about the Oklahoma City bombing? I don't have to have a show of hands for that for everybody in this room that's connected to that. The Dust Bowl, the Great Depression, World War II, not just the colorized or black and white versions of the documentary that we see on history or whatever, but the war that our parents, our grandparents, some of our great-grandparents fought over there and over here. 
the unvarnished, as they used to say in that, in that generation, with the bark off, what it was like. And if I could sum it up, it was very different from what our versions would be, as we rightly give homage, pay homage, and honor those people that saved the world from tyranny a couple of times. But uh, one of the women that I interviewed 30 years ago for this, whose husband was a decorated uh, naval officer that spent uh, the last year and a half of the war in a, in a German prison camp, I said, well, how would you sum up World War II? I was thinking, you know, in, in my Steven Spielberg, you know, influenced way, uh, she could say, well, it was like our, our days of our greatest glory or something like that. And she paused for a long time. And the only thing she said was, those were awful days. Awful days. Well, we can look back now and say they were awful, but they were also inspiring. And we stand on the shoulders of people that rose up and made the sacrifices that they did that they had to do, fighting empires that have been preparing for war for years when we had not. And uh, so to me, when we look at it through the lens of Oklahomans, and that's what we do, we have the 30,000 foot world history view, we have the American history view, but then we dig down, we plumb deeply into what was Oklahoma's World War II. I've never, I've never read that in the book, at least to the extent we, we deal with it. It's an entire chapter in our book. Yeah, next year, uh, Pastor Wade mentioned that Volume 2 will come out on Statehood Day. We're hoping we can eventually get November 16th to be a really special, recognized day in this state. And next year at the History Center is the launch. Some of y'all know that they've had Dr. Blackburn speak here before. If you haven't lately, have him come back. He was getting ready to retire, so he'll have more time probably, hopefully. But uh, Dr. Blackburn, it was his idea. Way back in 2005, he came up with the idea for the Oklahoma's book. Uh, he had that book he saw a moment ago, The War Between the States, on his desk. He, he called me in one day, and uh, he just pointed that book, and he said, can you write a book like this? about Oklahoma. And that's what started 15 years ago, the Oklahoma's pilgrimage. There's been times I wanted to strangle him for coming up with that idea. But uh, he's been a mentor to me ever since. Uh, he's read every chapter. We, we interview. I, I interview him with my little handy-dandy recording studio here. Uh, each time I would enter into a new chapter, before I would get into it, I would go spend a couple hours with Dr. Bob and uh, get his take on everything. And then we've had many other sessions since then to make sure that uh, we don't miss uh, what we need to hit. Patriot Park. Uh, Wade alluded to this. Uh, you know, the monuments, the monuments have been torn down. They've been thrown in oceans. They've been defamed. That I have no idea what all has been done to them. Uh, there's one monument, last I heard, has not been torn down, it's been left alone. Vladimir Lenin in, uh, is in Seattle or Portland in a very public park. That, that has not been touched. But just about everybody else, from Frederick Douglass to uh, missionary Junipero Serra uh, uh, to Martin Luther King Jr. and in between, uh, they've been tearing down. And so some of y'all saw a couple of months ago an Oklahoma State Senator, uh, Representing the district just next door to us to the west, Casey Murdoch, a panhandle boy, felt from Oklahoma, near where his ranch is. And he stepped up and he said publicly, if you don't want your monuments, Oklahoma will take them. Well, I read that and that fired me up. And I think the first person I called was Wade before I knew it, Wade had come. If y'all don't know Wade, he's a pretty shy guy. He, he never calls anybody, he doesn't know. But he made an exception that day and called Casey. And next thing we knew, we found out that Dr. Blackburn was trying to help Casey get the monument that was being taken down of Dr. Blackburn's hero, Teddy Roosevelt, in New York City, that they're taking down. And uh, that got the ball rolling. That's probably not going to happen because we, we thought the Smithsonian owned that, which the Oklahoma History Historic Society has a partnership with. But it turns out the city of New York owns it. So. Anyway, that got the ball rolling, though, and uh, what has happened in the few months since, 
is that we have had 60 acres of beautiful Garfield County land just north of Wauconus donated with the caveat that we get enough monuments either that other people had that don't, they don't want them for whatever reason or that we get duplicates made of, of statues that are already in place. Uh, there are people like H. Holden that go on and others that that can be a possibility for in certain cases. And that's the only caveat is we can have this land once we get a critical mass together where it's certainly going to happen. And that's 60 acres uh, looking from Highway 81 between Wacomas and Vance. Matt's looking toward Highway 81 uh, from the north side. And of course our goal, and by the way, Wade, you don't even know this, but uh, I have a phone call to be made this afternoon that we've got a couple of monuments in Texas that are uh, possibles for Patriot Park. But we just wanted to make you all aware, this is not something where we hope to just transfer a bunch of old, uh, weather-worn, dead people that young folks would never know who they were. Everything we do is going to have education woven and integrated and wrapped all the way around it. So we picture when these statues are brought into Patriot Park, uh, they'll have a pad there through whatever the, the current devices are that you can watch and hear this person's story. You can hear different perspectives. Uh, one of the things that our young people miss is they don't get taught the three-dimensionality of human beings. This person's a hero, this person's a villain. And 20 years later, it might flip-flop, but it's still a very one-dimensional portrait of almost everyone. We're not going to be afraid to hold honorable men and women up just because they don't pass muster with the pedigrees and the criteria of a certain, of a particular generation. But by the same token, we're not going to whitewash it and fail to tell the problematic parts of their lives. We'll have a visitor center there where there'll be uh, literature, and some of y'all can probably have a, a hand in that, letting us know what needs to be there. But we hope it to be a destination spot for Garfield County, where in years ahead, if it becomes dangerous to even have a monument, there will be one place that will always have it. And I'm thankful the president is trying to get that monument garden going in Washington, but I asked Senator Murdoch about that, and he said, I'd never trust one square foot of government space again that you put anything on. You don't know what will happen depending on who's in power at that time. Well, my uh, alarm's about to go off. So uh, I'm just going to close out with this. This arrowhead near Atoka uh, has a good story behind it for me because it's a reminder that even as a guy who gives his life to history, teaching and the study of it. I can get so prideful and puffed up. So I'm closing it out in the last 60 seconds. Um, one of my students at Southern Nazarene several years ago said, hey, Professor Guire, I've got something you might really be interested in. Well, well, what's that? What's that? Well, I've got a bunch of arrowheads. Arrowheads? Well, that sounds interesting. Where'd you find Well, I just dug them up next to the 7-Eleven in the token. This young lady drove two and a half hours from Toka to Bethany uh, twice a week for four years to get her degree while managing the loves in a Toka. So I had a lot of respect for her, but I, I was questionable about this. Well, digging up arrowheads right on, on and under the ground next to the 7-Eleven under the bridge in a Toka. So I let her bring them to me, and periodically she asked, well, have you found anything about those arrowheads? And, I'm not, not yet, but I'm getting to that. Well, the arrowheads, of course, they move from my desk to my end table to the shelf to the closet. And if much more time had gone by, they'd probably been in the attic. But at, at a certain point, about a year later, she said, Can I just have my arrowheads back? <laughs> well, I was so embarrassed. I said, Give me one week. So at the time, I was living in Norman in the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey, probably the foremost archaeological. Uh, you know, crew in Oklahoma was all of five minutes from me. And within 24 hours, I, I had gotten an appointment with their head people, taken arrowheads over there, and found that out. 
they were up there as many as 3,500 years old. And, uh, you know, most of them in the history books in the past, they, now our history hadn't even gone back that far. It's gone back to the mound builders. Well, while I was there, I found this little guy. That's about life size. The American bison apparently used to be about twice the size they are now. Just northwest of here, up around Fort Supply, they were mounting and molding him the day I was there. He's more than 5,000 years old in the Fort Supply area. So in closing, I just want to say that we have a remarkable country. We have an unparalleled history. And it has every shade of good and evil and in between. But it's something that our young people deserve and need to learn about. What was it Ben Franklin said? You have a republic if you can hang on to it. Folks, whether we like it or not, we have been called for such a time as this. It's us. We're the generation. I think we all know there are, there are pivot points in the months ahead, maybe the years ahead, that are going to determine what kind of country we have. Are we just correcting and improving and making up for past wrongs and ills? Or are we overthrowing and going a completely different direction? Do we break our founders' hearts who gave up, who offered their blood, their honor, their sacred honor, and their treasure for what we all have been blessed with in our lives? I thank you for listening. Oklahoma 
okay, at the time that most of these things were happening, these landings and all, less than 100,000 people, about one person per square mile for the entire two territories. By contrast, in New York, New York was only two thirds the size of Oklahoma, had almost five million people, as opposed to 80 or 90,000 people. There, and there were massive millions of immigrants that were coming in legally that needed places to live. So I'm saying all that not to excuse how the tribes were treated, not to excuse the writing of treaties that were broken, but to say that this was a very difficult, real time series of historical events that succeeding generations of American leaders pressured by the people. And I, and I, I hasten to add, whether it was Andrew Jackson saying, you know, Chief Justice Marshall's made his law, let him enforce it now as far as not letting the Cherokees keep their land in North Georgia, or whether it was the allotments and the disbursement of the tribal sovereignty before statehood. Every step of the way, if you look closely, the political leaders were being pressured by the American public to do what they did. So there, there was more just a few people that made bad decisions in the line. There was oppressive history, okay? What was it like? Well, uh, uh, and I'll close here, maybe one interesting takeaway was the tribal leaders that were roughly mostly in the eastern half of Oklahoma, they made a great attempt, and we have a full page map of this, they proposed the state of Sequoia in 1905. They wanted to have Indian territory basically become their own state. Oklahoma territory that we're part of would be another state. Well, that was voted down. And probably in the long view of history, it would make it good because Oklahoma's got more population and more power. And it was voted down because ultimately through the discussion, right, they decided that they wanted to be one, they wanted to be together. Well, actually it was, it was I say voted down, might not be the best term. Uh, President Roosevelt in Washington was a Republican. He didn't want two new Democratic states coming in, which they would have been both Democratic. So he didn't, he didn't really want Oklahoma and his constitution coming in at all, okay? There was a lot of behind the scenes negotiations to get us in. But the main reason that that did not happen was because President Roosevelt made it clear you can come in as one state or not at all. So that, that kind of wasn't really the Oklahoma Territory people that overruled them as far as I know. They may have agreed with it, but I don't know. Get why you want the Oklahomans. Have time for one more slip? Yes, sir. Wade probably knows what I'm going to say. It's one of the physically smallest Oklahomans I've ever heard of. Have y'all ever seen the little monument sitting on the bench inside the east entrance to the state capitol? Anybody ever seen that? Yeah. Who is that? Remember? Kate Barnard. Kate Barnard. Uh, Oklahoma's good angel. Our Kate. These are some of the things they... This was a lady, and I'll close with one quick story. She was the champion of the underdog, the oppressed, the marginalized, whatever you want to fill in. We, everybody can claim her today, right? Uh, Democrats can claim her because she was for the people that the powerful people stepped on. Republicans can claim her because she was a devout you know, Catholic who would be pro-life. You know? So again, it's hard to pin labels on people from other generations, but I'll tell you this, my label, she's a hero. Just one for instance, we were so poor, we need to remember this when we get criticized when we're 46 or 48 and something like we hear all the time. This state might have been the poorest state ever. It was, it was settled by a bunch of people that were poor and tough, right? Whether it's the tribes being forced here, whether it's the ex-slaves coming out for a better chance, whether it's the people riding the land runs because it was the only place they could get land they could afford. It was free, okay? So we started out that way. Our prisoners, when we became a state, we couldn't even afford our own prison. So we trained them up to a lovely place called Leavenworth. Leavenworth Prison, Fort Leavenworth. And Kate Barnard, who got more votes for commissioner of charities and something, corrections. She got more votes than Charles Haskell did when he was elected governor, the first governor of Oklahoma. 
before women had to vote in this state. It was all men that voted for her. Well, she called in. Somebody told Kate, they've been a prisoner that got out and said, they're killing literally our boys up there in Leavenworth. We were paying them lots of money, basically renting our prisoners out. And they were to get fed and watered and all that. And Leavenworth, they weren't doing it. They had underground mines. They weren't feeding. They were dying. And there was a high incident of death rate, mortality rate. Kate Barnard got on a train and went up there herself. I think she took a couple of Oklahoma marshals with her, is all she had. Unannounced, went into that prison and, and went everywhere. And they tried to keep her out, and she would just, you know, she was like four foot 11, 95 pounds. And she would see the, the worst, most emaciated looking prisoner in sight, and she would go over to him, have those marshals guard her, and she would ask him everything that happened. And my gosh, I think by the time she got back to Oklahoma City, Governor Haskell already had orders for another train to go up there and train them all down to another lovely place, McAllister. That's what began McAllister. But at least that was the beginning where we had our own prisoners in our own state taking care of them and watching out over it. That's the sort of thing Kate Barnard did. But Kate Barnard died alone, broke, forgotten, and unliked by all the important people in Oklahoma, most of them, in around 1930. Other people in our book, heroes of early Oklahoma, did not like her at all. So yeah, you can have heroes that did not like each other and even battled against each other. So at the end of her days, it looked like Kate Barnard had lost. But here we are. Did Kate Barnard really lose? It's her statue on that bench inside the Capitol. And anybody that ever hears me teach or say anything, it doesn't take long for them to hear about Kate Barnard from Sorry to go over. Thank you very much.